Good morning, everybody. How you doing? My name's David. I'm one of the pastors here. Last week, if you weren't here, we kicked off a brand new series called Gym Class. If you were not with us, you can go on our website or our Facebook page, watch that message. We kind of outlined the entire book. Today, we're jumping into the deep end because James is a very abrupt guy, as we learned last week. He doesn't use all that flowery, flowery language like Paul uses to introduce his letters when Paul says, peace and mercy and grace and our most gracious Lord Jesus Christ and on and on. James just says, greetings. Now to you. And he goes off. So we're going to just jump right in. If you want to grab the worship notes that are in the middle of your worship folder, and we'll walk through some understandings today about how to develop endurance. So in chapter 1, the uh, beginning of verse number 2, we read these words. James says, Consider it pure joy when Santa comes and you get everything on your wish list and life has no problems. I wish it read like that, don't you? James is a little too honest. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops endurance. And your worship folder in your Bibles, underline develops endurance. It's going to be real important since that's the title this morning. And let endurance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Now, some of you are reading along with me. You're reading on the screen. You're reading in your Bible. You're reading there in your, your worship notes. And you're going, come on, David. Joy in the midst of trials. Do you live in a glass bubble, David? I mean, you're a pastor. You work one day a week. You've got no problems. Do you not understand what real life is like? I'm in the middle of a storm right now, and I can't find my way out. I've got this difficult season that I'm dealing with. I don't need some recreational Bible teaching from some glasshouse pastor telling me how to get along with a big smile on my face when my life sucks. You been there? You're wondering where God is. You're wondering why God doesn't care. You're wondering if God really is there, why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he say something? Because you're trying to figure out how to keep your whole life from blowing up. Most of us in this room have lived long enough to understand these three things to be true. As you go through life, every day of your life, you're either going into a trial, you're in the midst of a trial, or you're emerging from a trial. Does that sound familiar to you? See, aren't you glad you came here today for this positive word of encouragement? The reality is this. God allows every one of us to go through trials sometimes and no one on planet earth is immune in the little teaser that you saw it said that james was the brother of jesus jesus said these words here in john chapter 16 i have told you all this so that you may have peace in me here in, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows but take heart because i have overcome the world you know what just hit me I just wondered, we read what James said, now we're reading what Jesus says. Do you think like when Jesus was 12 and James was 11 and they were laying in their bunk beds at night, they talked about this kind of stuff? It just, that's the stuff that goes through my mind when I'm up here. You can't tell, but it's really busy in there. But see, this is why TV preachers drive your pastor nuts. They tell us that God wants everyone to be healthy and wealthy and wise and you'll never have problems and you'll never get sick and yet Jesus himself is telling us the exact opposite. And James says, you're going to have trials. Not only are you going to have them, they're unpredictable. Think about this in real life and real time. You don't see a flat tire coming, do you? You don't get up running late for work, go out in your garage to start your car and expect to have a dead battery. You don't anticipate having a kidney stone in the middle of the night. You don't anticipate that there's going to be a malignancy that you're going to think about in advance. You couldn't see the economic collapse coming when you purchased your dream home. You were unprepared when your teenage daughter said, I'm pregnant. Trials are unpredictable. Trials also come in all shapes and all sizes. And they come, as James says, in many kinds. Now, when James says you have trials of many kinds or trials of various kinds, depending on your translation, he doesn't mean that they're going to run the gamut from a flat tire to malignancy and everything in between. He also means that they are going to vary in their degrees of intensity. The fact of the matter is, some trials are minor. And other trials are real, real major problems. 
Some trials take three weeks to overcome. Some take three minutes. Some take three years. Some take three decades. So a little context, as we learned last week, James is writing to whom? He's writing to first century Christians who have been scattered throughout the entire region. Many of them were chased from their homes. They were chased from their city. They were chased from their jobs. Many families were separated. They had been scattered, and they were going through all kinds of difficulties. Imagine carrying that kind of weight for three weeks or three months or for 30 years. See, one of the things that I'm constantly aware of when I'm teaching here is that I am speaking to Americans. Many of you are American Christians. Some of you are pre-Christians, but you're on your way. But we have a tendency to read the Bible only through American eyes, through American understanding, through American uh, theological concepts. And yet the Bible was written once and, once and for all for a global audience, right? Right? So when James is writing to people who says, when you're going through trials of varying kinds, we have our own issues in here, and we'll get to that in a minute. But this same truth is applying to men and women in the Middle East who never know when the, the uh, Islamic radicals and extremists are going to come down into their village, that a sword or a knife is going to be put to their throat. James is writing these same words to a group of people in Syria who never know when a next chemical weapon attack is going to bring death and destruction and they might wake up without a family member or they're going to wake up infirm. James is writing to an, uh, an audience in South Africa who is constantly dealing with the disease and the destruction that comes. He's writing to the people in South America who are constantly having to deal with the drug cartels and certain sickness that comes. He's not just writing to an American audience. This is written to the church of Jesus Christ and humankind globally. Now, some of us in this room, we've got our own issues to some degree or another. Some of you here are carrying a weight in your life that no one else really understands. You know, I get that this is the greater Phoenix area, that some of you in this room are caring for elderly parents who are dealing with cancer or heart disease or dementia and it's a weight that drags you down and it it's pulling some of the physical life out of you it's pulling some of the emotional resolve out of you but the rest of the people in this room don't really know that some of you are dealing with past physical or sexual abuse and just trying to find the strength to overcome those kinds of things some of you are dealing with a hidden addiction that not even the person sitting at the table with you this morning knows about. Some of you are dealing with incomprehensible job pressures. Some of you have got financial pressures because the debt has mounted and mounted and mounted for whatever reason. Some of you are dealing with certain eating disorders on one end of the continuum or the other. We all have issues, we all have weights, we all have trials of many kinds. And at times, some of those trials are paralyzing. James, or G James and Jesus are both telling us when, not if, trials hit, that our perspective or our point of view matters. Jesus says, when the trials come, be of good cheer. James says, consider it pure joy. And I'm going to be real honest with you. I've not yet fully achieved that level of maturity in my walk with Jesus. Am I alone? See, when the storm hits, if you're anything like me, you're just trying to survive. You can't really see how any good or any positive can come from it. Maybe you heard about the man who had been training and preparing for literally for years to swim the English Channel. He had done so well in his preparation and his t time trials that, the, that his hometown had already prepared the banners. They'd already prepared the ticker tape parade. All he had to do was now go out and swim. When he gets in the channel and he takes off, when he's about a third of the way through, he is already like multiple minutes ahead of the world record when, and things are looking great. And then the storm hits. The water gets a little choppy, and it gets really, really cold. And when the storm hit, it ushers in some jellyfish who begin stinging him. 
And as he's getting stung by the jellyfish, as the waves are getting higher and choppier and more difficult, as the water's getting colder and his, his body is beginning to affect, he finally just says at the halfway mark, that's it, I quit. And he turns around and swims back. Only about three of you got that. That's actually a pretty good joke. The rest of you are going, is that real or not? See, folks, when you give up halfway, you get all of the pain and none of the reward. Some of you may have read the biography of Winston Churchill. It's 4,000 pages long. Churchill leads Britain through its darkest days, and as after he does, he is literally kicked out of office. One day his wife says to him, it's probably a blessing in disguise, to which Churchill responds, yes, a very effective disguise. James and Jesus aren't masochists. James and Jesus aren't going, yeah, you're supposed to go, yay, I get to suffer. I feel so spiritual when I suffer. They're not saying that as you endure, that you could consider that the trial and the tribulation is this wonderful thing that makes you better. They're not saying, thank God for the trial. They're not saying, you know, when you're in the midst of it, thank God my husband left me. Thank God I lost my job. Thank God my house burned down two days ago. They're saying what you are to do that produces joy in the midst of the trial is to thank God for what he can do for you as you go through it. See, folks, your faith is tested through the trials, but it's not produced through them. And if we're going to be really honest, here's the understanding. Trials always reveal what's inside of us. And trials have a way of revealing what needs attention inside of us. Somebody once said, people are a lot like tea bags. You don't know what's on the inside of them until you put them in hot water. I thought about that. And so if you ever wondered how we're going to pay for that build out, Connect Church is now being brought to you by Diet Dr. Pepper. No, not really. Not a bad idea, though. Um, I've got two cans of soda here. One can is empty, and the other can is unopened. Life is a little bit like these two cans of soda. When you are empty, when you're not filled with the right thing that produces an internal resolve, that produces a quality of character that allows you to stand firm and withhold the pressure. When the pressure comes, when the storms hit, you're like the empty can of soda and it has a way of crushing you. The same storms and the same pressure are still going to hit. But when you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Lord in the midst of life, you can withstand the same pressure. You can withstand the same storm. Your life doesn't have to get crushed. Your joy doesn't have to go away. You don't have to give up and turn around and quit. I'm putting the same pressure, if not more so, on this can. But because of how it's filled from the inside, it's withstanding the pressure from the outside. Same is true for me. The same is true for you. When we are not hollow on the inside, when we have not bought into the wrong things on the inside, when we are not distributing life from a, an inconclusive philosophy, but we have the understanding of the glory of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit and the strength that He gives us from the inside out, when the storms hit, when the pressure comes, when the trials are coming, you're still going to get sunburned. You're still going to get rain in your face. You're still going to get scarred up knees and skinned up elbows, but you can withstand it and life doesn't fall apart. Are you still with me? Does that make sense? See, problems and crisis and pressure and pain are all things that come to us from external circumstances. There are the things that happen on the outside. But when they happen, they really reveal what's going on on the inside of us. Now, here's the great irony in all of this. We try to avoid pain in life whenever we can. That's why our medicine cabinets are full of Advil for headache pain and Bengay for arthritic pain and cough syrup for throat pain. And yet pain is always a pathway to growth. What we want 
is gain without pain. We all want abs without sit-ups. We want biceps without weights. We want to be wise without reading, smart without learning. We want to be the president of the company without starting out in the mail room. We want children without the pain of childbirth. We want the church to grow without the pain of change. And we all want to go to heaven without the pain of dying. And life's just not that way. There's no gain in your life. There's no spiritual gain. There's no physical gain. There's no financial gain. There's no relational gain without some form of pain. And think about it like this. Just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. And yet there's no celebration on Easter without the pain of a bloodstained cross. Here's the deal. None of us get to choose our trials in life. None of us get to choose when those trials come at us. But all of us get to choose our attitude in the midst of the trials, and all of us get to choose how we will respond to every trial in our life. And if we're going to be really transparent today, most of us in this room never change anything in our lives until a trial of some kind slaps us in the face and forces us to change. We don't just kind of drift into spiritual maturity. We don't kind of drift into any kind of maturity. It usually takes a push, and most of the time that push is called pain. Think about it like this. At whatever age and stage you find yourself in sitting in this room this morning, if you decided you wanted to get in your optimal physical condition and you went and you looked into an exercise regime and a, and a certain diet and a certain fitness uh, routine, you were going to have to do so much cardio and, and so much weights and you're going to have to eat this way and not eat that way and all the things that you're going to have to do. Is there ever going to be a point in time when you're going to wake up with sore muscles? Is there ever going to be a point in time when you think, I'm not going to go do that today, I quit? Is there ever going to be a point in time when you think, is this worth it? My body aches, my stomach's hungry, my legs are sore, my mind is tired, I don't feel like I can go on. Same way it plays out in life, same way it plays out in our own pursuit of spiritual maturity. Some of us just get out of shape spiritually. And when a trial hits and a storm comes and we're trying to get through the adversity and get back to normal, there's some pain, there's some sore muscles, there's a sore spirit, there's a tired mind. Sometimes we just want to quit. I learned a lot about this when I was growing up. I've been fortunate last week and this week to have my parents in from Ohio for a few weeks. My wife's ready for him to go home, but I'm still pleased. <laughs> Not really. It's more like the other way around. Um, see, I learned a lot of lessons from my parents. Some of those lessons, you know that some of the best things in life are caught, not taught. You know what I mean? And back in the 70s, when the economy tanked and mortgage interest rates were like 16, 17, 18 percent, and there were not very many jobs and the company my dad had been working for shut down just right about the time that our family moved. And I watched my dad do whatever he could, three or four jobs a day, drive a coal truck, a gravel truck, a bus, just whatever, just to feed us and pay our, our little bit of mortgage that we had because we couldn't complete the move to build the dream home that my parents had already had the plans drawn up for. We never got there. And every week, every week, we'd go to church. And I'd watch my mom put the tithe check in the offering. Every week, we still ate. And we would gather in those times. Now, here's what I learned. Later on in my own life, when some adversities came my way, and the only job I could get to pay my mortgage was loading boxes in 100 degree heat with 100% humidity in the belly of a FedEx truck. I flash back to those moments. The stuff that my parents went through to provide for my sisters and me was not fun. It was painful. It was difficult. It was hard. But it was also temporary. 
And I knew that the trial, the adversity in my life would also be temporary. I knew that the pain that I was experiencing was real. And I could either stand in the pain and embrace it and ask God what he wanted me to learn about him or about myself in the midst of it. Or I could run from it and eventually I'd have to come back around again. I did that through job experiences. When my then wife, my former wife, looked me in the eye and said, I've been unfaithful, confessed adultery, and literally turned around and walked out on me. I had to learn how, what it meant to stand in the pain and say, God, you didn't cause this, but God, what do you want to teach me through it? Because the decisions I made in that moment, in the midst of immense personal betrayal and pain, would determine the kind of person I was going to be a year, two years, five years, ten years down the road. Throughout the course of my life in ministry, there have been times when I have felt so betrayed as a pastor or so berated and everything within me yelled, David, just quit and go sell cars. And yet without a doubt, those experiences in the continuum of my life have been those that have contributed the most to my spiritual maturation how I've matured as a man, as a husband, as a pastor, as a leader. They have been periods of stretching and growing in my life. You see, folks, your point of view matters no matter where you are in life. So go back to chapter, to chapter 1, verse number 3. See what James says. James says, because you know what? That the testing of your faith develops endurance. See, the easiest thing in our life to do when tough times come is to quit. It's always easier to quit than endure. Let me ask you a question. For just a moment, con consider the continuum of your life. When you lay in bed wide awake at 2 in the morning and you think about your life, what have you quit that you wish you hadn't? If God were to sit down at your table this morning and look you in the eye and say, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a mulligan for any one thing in your life if you want to go back and pick it up and start from there and go on. What's the one thing that pops into your mind that you gave up on that you wish you hadn't and you would go back and change it if you could? For some of us, we gave up too soon on music lessons, whether that be piano or guitar or voice or tuba. Some of us gave up way too soon on a job and we wish we could have that job back. Some of us gave up on a gym membership or a diet. Some of us gave up on a friendship or a relationship because the pain got intense and you were afraid that you were going to get hurt and you walked away rather than risk loving and being hurt. Some of us in this room gave up on a marriage and we're the ones that walked away some of us in this room gave up on God maybe we went to church as a kid we go off to college we forget all about him maybe you got distracted maybe there was a bump in the road maybe you moved well I met this guy I met this girl why did you quit understanding why you quit is important did you quit out of frustration did you quit out of fear did you quit out of discouragement did you quit because you bought the myth of the greener grass did you quit because of financial pressure did you quit because it was actually better for your family did you quit because it was causing health issues did you quit because there wasn't enough pride or enough prestige did you quit because you weren't making enough money why you quit matters because once you begin to understand why you quit then you come to the point where you can work forward from it and what you what do you wish you had endured what do you wish you had persevered through in a room this size I would give great odds that there are a number of you who are struggling today just to hang on some of you in this room you're just doing your best to hang on to a marriage that's been torn apart for months or maybe years some of you in this room you're doing your best to hang on to your sobriety. You're always afraid to walk out of these doors on Sunday because you don't know if you're going to be able to come back sober next Sunday. Some of you in this room are holding on to a job. Some of you are holding on to your emotional stability. 
Some of you are fighting through an illness that is wearing you down. Some of you are dealing with loneliness that is so intense you can hardly stand it. Some of you are loosely holding on to faith. Your spiritual life started out like a rocket, but when the storms hit and the struggles came and the pressure began to crush your life, all of a sudden church is boring and the Bible seems hollow and your prayers seem to go unanswered. For those of you in this room this morning who are struggling to hang on, I want you to hear loud and clear that I believe God brought you to Connect Church today on purpose so you could sit in gym class and hear one word. Endure. It's there in your notes. God wants you to hear what it means to endure. One of the unexpected gifts of trials is that they teach us how to endure and not give up. How does that happen? I don't want to sound flippant or trite, but Americans like easy fixes. We like to be able to go out and buy things. Yesterday, my wife and my parents, we had a great time out just buying stuff. I hope today we have a great time returning stuff, but you, we just like to go out and buy stuff. Or we like to be gifted stuff. We like to be given stuff. The problem with endurance is you can't buy it. It can't be gifted to you. It cannot be given to you. James is really clear on how we get endurance. Endurance in my life and yours can only be what? Talk to me. Developed. It can only be developed. And usually development means you have to go through something. You have to experience something. And usually to experience the development of endurance means that we've got to experience some difficulties, some pain, some struggles, some adversity. How do we do that? This is going to sound so cheesy. I'm almost afraid to say it. And yet it's so true. I have to say it. One day at a time. One day at a time. Whatever it is you're experiencing, you don't necessarily have to endure it or persevere it for the rest of your life. You just have to endure it today. See, people in Alcoholics Anonymous and Celebrate Recovery and Mending the Soul all know this. They all understand it. You don't have to stay sober the rest of your life. You just have to stay sober the next three hours or the next six hours or the next 10 hours. And then when you get up, you do it all over again, but you do it day by day. I'm looking at my life. Some of you are aware that um, ever since about last Labor Day, I've been running full throttle because we're not yet to a size with the level of income where we can have multiple persons on staff who have teaching gifts. So most of the teaching kind of falls onto my plate. And I think about the schedule and, and I'm thinking, okay, I got to do 37 more messages between now and Christmas. Last week, I was in Los Angeles for a day and I, I did some leadership training on behalf of Transformation Ministries on Wednesday. Later part of this coming week, I fly to Seattle and I teach for two days for the Salvation Army. I'll get home late Friday night. I've got a funeral on Saturday. I've got to be in here and preach again on Sunday morning. And I'm thinking about all of those messages and all of those things. And then the reality hits me because at this stage in life, I've learned a little bit more about how to handle pressure than I did when I was a little bit younger. And it occurs to me, I don't have to write 37 messages this week. I just got to finish this one today and write a new one tomorrow. And that's it. I don't have to allow these things to overwhelm me. I don't have to prepare for every seminar I'm going to do in other places for other groups for the next five years. I just need to have the one done for the Salvation Army this week. And I learned how to do this by enduring the trials and the pressure and the struggles. The same thing with this church. When I think about the pressure that falls on some of us in leadership around here about, okay, we're, we're close to about $200,000 in cash and pledges for our build out, but now we've got to find another $100,000. Where's that going to come from? It looks like the well's running dry. And then I remember that we serve the God who owns the cattle on the thousand hills and he has called us to something. He will see us through something. And so we'll just get through that one day at a time. You think about the things that go on in a church. For some of you, the things that are going on in your connection group. Think about the struggles with your job and with your marriage. 
Here's the question each one of us has to deal with on a very personal way today. What difficult situation are you wanting to quit on and God is asking you to finish? Because once you understand why you quit things, then you'll learn how to endure things. God brought you here today to hear one word. Endure. Today. Now, as you grow in this understanding and you grow in this thing that the Bible calls endurance and joy has a way of refilling your tank when your tank begins to get low, it leads to a second gift that you'll understand. And that was found in verse number four when James says that you might be mature, complete, not lacking in anything, and that is to be mature. You heard about the guy who walks into Walgreens one day and he looks up to the pharmacist and he asks if he has anything for hiccups and a pharmacist reaches out and slaps him in the face. The guy's like, why'd you do that? He said, well, you don't have the hiccups anymore, do you? And the guy's like, no, but my wife's in the car and she still has them. <laughs> well, trials have a way of slapping you in the face. And pain has a way of getting your attention like nothing else. C.S. Lewis said those famous words, God speaks to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. See, going through gym class in the book of James, the journey that we're taking here, is going to not tell us how to avoid pain. It's going to tell us how to endure pain in the same kind of way if you were to do a gym membership to get your body in optimal shape. You can't avoid sore muscles. You can't avoid certain pains. You can't avoid what it's like to be hungry. But you can learn how to endure it while your body adjusts. The difference is in gym class here at Connect Church, you don't have to go through the adjustment period alone. You've got hundreds of people to go through it with you. And if you're watching online, you can email us, you can call us, you can ask us how to get into one of our groups, even if you don't come here on Sunday mornings because we don't want you learning how to endure it alone. We want you to learn what it means to go through this together. Sometimes I wonder when I stand up and I'm speaking at churches or I'm speaking at conferences or whatever, how many of you humbled yourself before Jesus Christ and you came to him somewhere in your past because you were going through a tough time or a trial in your life? I'm not asking for a show of hands, okay? Keep your hands down. But I would guess that the number would be pretty high. You came to Jesus Christ or you initially sought Jesus Christ because your marriage was crumbling or an illness hit or your boyfriend dumped you, your girlfriend dumped you or it went through a time when you buried your mom or you buried your best friend or when the economy collapsed and you were faced with financial pressures. My guess if I were to ask for a show of hands, lots of hands would go up in that scenario. On the other hand, if I were to ask how many of you finally received Jesus in your life because you won the Mega Millions lottery? or because you received the promotion of all promotions at work, or because your child made the honor roll or got accepted into a very prestigious college, my guess is not nearly as many hands would go up. The reality is, whether it's your life or mine, we rarely grow until a trial pushes us. Think about it like this. If you were to ask a silversmith or someone who works with metals, how to purify metal, they would always say you purify metal by turning up the heat, right? In the same way, when you turn up the heat in our own lives, we find out what's important and what's not important. We find out what we prioritize and what we don't. We identify impurities and imperfections. When the silversmith gets asked, how do you know when the silver is pure? His response is this when I can see my reflection in it. And in the same kind of way, folks, God uses trials to turn up the heat in our life, to refine us so that we can begin to reflect Jesus Christ in all the areas of our lives. Our good days and our bad days and all the days in between. God sometimes allows fires in our lives to purify us. See, Anybody can be loving when everybody is nice to you. Nobody needs patience if you've never gone to the DMV. <laughs> Nobody needs to exercise self-control if you only have lean cuisine in your refrigerator. 
And I want to pause right here for just a moment. We are intentionally a multi-generational church. For some of you in this room who are a little bit older and you've been through some trials and you've been through some storms, we actually need more of you, not less of you. We need every one of you over the age of 60 or whatever involved in a connection group or involved in a ministry or sitting out there under, under a tent today at that picnic because we need these 20-somethings and 30-somethings who are going through some of the most painful times in our lives to know that there is a mature Christian person who's a part of Connect Church who has already been there and they can trust what God did in you. But if you're not involved and they can't go to you, then this church loses and a whole generation of people misses out. There's a great time to applaud. That's truth. One of the things about where I am in life today is I've been able to mature in ministry and now that I have the privilege of going and sharing with some young and up-and-coming pastors uh, from time to time, one of the things I realized, this is what I was doing with TM this past week, I learned, you know what, I'm not as uptight in ministry as I used to be. I don't get all befuddled when somebody catches me in the lobby and points their finger in my face and tells me everything I'm doing is wrong. I don't get all upset when the budget gets tight and we're not exactly sure where the next round of money is going to come from. I don't get all excited about the kinds of situations and frustrated when somebody's telling me that the, the, the difficult situations are going on in their life and I don't care. I've learned this about God as I've gone through the trials in marriage and in life and in ministry and as I stand here before you today, I've learned that God can be trusted. The world is not out of control. God's still in charge. His promises are true. His love is real and He is available. Leads me to my last thought real quickly. As you endure, you then mature. And the whole point of that, besides sounding like Jesse Jackson, is that you eventually reap a reward. James chapter 1, verse 12, and we'll get to this a little more thoroughly next week. He says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, there are two things happening in this verse. As James' letter is being dispersed, and you learned that that was the first letter of the New Testament, so at one point in time, that was the entire Bible. Those people are understanding that in the here and now, as you're raising your family, as they have been scattered abroad, as they're dealing with job pressures and marital pressures and financial pressures and physical pressures, that here and now, as you mature, there is a reward that God will give you as you, as you stand firm. There's also the eternal reward. What we have given our lives to here on this earth will be rewarded in the life ever after. And for all of us who would endure, there is this heavenly equivalent of a gold medal to be given to each of us for our character. The reward is given for those who don't give up. Think about this. Just go through the Bible with me for just a minute real quick. When Noah had about 120 years to, to prepare for the flood and build the ark, what if Noah had said, you know what, it's not worth it, it's a bunch of lies, and he had given up at year 107? None of us would be here. What if Paul had said, you know what, I've been beaten, I've been shipwrecked, I've been in jail, I can't do any more, I'm going to go back and be a Pharisee. It's easier to persecute people than it is to love people. What if Jesus had gone to the garden and said, you know what, God, I know what the plan was from day one, but as I kneel here before you, I'm changing the game. God, now it's about my will be done, not your will be done. Every one of us would be left out, right? The question is, what are you doing with those unexpected troubles and trials and circumstances in your life? Because every one of us has two choices. You can avoid them, or you can embrace them. It's only as we are torn to pieces that any of us is made whole. Calvin Coolidge, President Calvin Coolidge said these words, no person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. I have a friend named Rob Collins. He's a good friend. We grew up in the same town together. Rob pastors a church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. It's a smaller church. Rob's giving his life to it. A few weeks ago, Rob tweeted these words. He said, everything you have experienced up to this point has equipped you for what you're going through right now. And then here it is. And what you are going through right now 
will equip you for what's next. Isn't that good? See, folks, endurance is not earned, it is not purchased, it is not given. Endurance is only developed. And you get to choose it or not choose it. But that's 100% your decision. So I want to pray for you here in just a moment. Would you bow your heads for Jeremiah and the group lead us on a song? But if you're struggling with this issue, maybe there's an unexpected pain or difficulty in your life, and you're wanting to quit, but God spoke to you this morning. Don't walk out on that marriage. Don't prematurely give up on that diet or that health thing or what you're doing with your body. Don't, don't give up on that job. Don't give up on that teenage son, that teenage daughter. Don't give up on Connect Church. They're going to get around this curve. But God's asking you to stand steady in the pressure. But you need His help. And it's a little bit hard. Would you just lift your hand up and back down? I'm just going to pray for you. That's all I'm going to do. Yeah, all around the room. Father, you are amazing. We sang that song about there's no mountain you won't climb and no wall you wouldn't kick in because of your love. And God, you don't hide the realities from us that life is difficult. You said, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. And James said, when you go through trials of varying kinds, you never hide the difficulties of life from us. You also never hide that as we go through the difficulties of life, you are with us and there is no shadow of failing with you. And yet, God, I've walked through some valleys. And sometimes, sometimes in our humanity, we wonder if you're really with us. Sometimes, God, we wonder if you even care. And yet that's our human frailties talking. The understanding is you never leave us or forsake us. You are always with us. And so, Father, for those hands that went up this morning, and even for those who didn't raise their hand, but there's something else going on inside of them, pray that you would minister. What one word of encouragement do they need from somebody at their table? What conversation do they need to have today at the picnic? What question in their connection group this week needs, do they need to linger on? What passage in their Bible and their personal devotions later this week do they need to, to find? What do you need to say to them right now, Lord Jesus? Because there's power in your name. What do you need to say to them right now? That would be just enough to get them through today. God, you are amazing. And I absolutely love you and adore you. And we give you all praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.
you glad you came today? Hey, we're glad that you guys are here. Uh, Ashley told you about the picnic. Here's what I want you to understand. If today is your first Sunday and you just feel like you want to hang out and get to know some, well, some pretty goofy people, make your way to Red Mountain Park. There's plenty of food, plenty of games. We just want to get to know you. We can't get to know you if you're not there. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the strength that you give in the midst of the storms. We thank you for your honesty before us that gives us an understanding that you are working with us to create a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ in each of our lives. God, thank you for the trials that produce the character that leads to the eventual reward. We worship you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...